Check Complete, a referee podcast, is an educational resource for referees by referees designed to connect and develop soccer officials of all ages and skill levels to better serve the game both on and off the field. It's episode three time of the Check Complete podcast, episode three. Uh, Gordy, your usual host, alongside our guest host of the week, Nathan Calling. Nathan, how are you? Fantastic. Thanks for having me here. It's so great to have you here, Nathan. Now, how long have you been refereeing what you call refereeing? I say it. Not many people would agree that I am a referee. Right. Um, you know, I'm just there and I'm doing things, but I guess we can call it refereeing. Sure. Um, but yeah, I've been doing this for about 12, 13 years now. Um, you know, starting to move up, get some better games, but at the end of the day, just your average everyday referee. Puts his pants on one leg at a time. Sort of. I try. Unless you jump from the edge of the bed and then, never mind. Anyway, uh, so we're here with, it's episode three time. I uh, hope you've enjoyed episodes one and two. If you haven't watched those, pause this video, go watch those, and then come back. Just do it. Trust me, it'll be worth your time. But today we're excited. We've got a lot of uh, good content that we are excited to present to you. We've got some uh, fan mail. We're going to go to the fan mail bag here to talk about. None of this came in through actual mail. This was all electronic. I think we're past the actual mail stage. But, oh, gosh, it would be amazing if you sent actual mail. I don't know who you'd send it to because we haven't published an address. But just send it. Attach it to the leg of a trained fox and send it to us. It would be amazing. Um, so we've got fan mail that we're going to talk about. We've heard from you. We want to hear more from you. And then we've got a couple of, actually, a couple of interviews. So we published on our social media accounts uh, an email that I received. I, as, a, as an instructor, I had a student, um, and her and her son participated in an entry-level clinic that I taught back in February. And she had reached out to me. This was middle of March. She would reached out to me and, and said, hey, I'm getting ready to go down to work a tournament. And uh, she's brand new. And she goes, I uh, was assigned the middle, a, a whistle for a 17 boys game. And uh, she asked if there's any advice that I have for her, so I sent her a few things. I published that screenshot, and uh, a lot of you guys weighed in on advice, on just little fun things. Go have fun, have a great time, enjoy yourself, yada, yada, yada. So we reached back out to her. We talked with her. Um, and so we're going to publish that interview with you today. You're going to love that, hopefully. If not, just keep it to yourself, all right? Um, very sensitive. And then we have an interview with the one, the only, Corey Rockwell. So we're super excited for you guys to hear that. Uh, we, we chatted with Corey for a little while, and he's he's wonderful. He is something else, let me tell you. Yes, larger than life. He is a, a wonderful, wonderful guy. So let's jump right into it. We got fan mail. We got fan mail. And so we want to hear from you on fan mail. If you have um, you know, any of the segments that we've done in the past that you've watched, we can revisit those things. So if you've watched those and you'd like to, to weigh in, go ahead and engage with us, direct message or the private message on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at check underscore complete, or you can write those to us, uh, questions at checkcompletepodcast.com. So in uh, one of our episodes, we were talking about the kind of the funny things that we hear at the pregame interchange between referees and players. And so uh, this is interesting. A friend of mine, PJ, uh, she's a volleyball official here in Overland Park. She said volleyball only allows one speaking captain. No one else can approach an official with a question. Very interesting. Yeah, in volleyball, you can't you can't approach official with a question. You just there's only one person that can. So maybe that's maybe it migrated over from volleyball. I mean, we could we could try it out. Let's see how it goes. I don't know if I want to do that. But yes, and then she also said that the volleyball they've got like triangulars and quads that they'll play. So there'll be teams like let's say there's like four teams showing up to to play in one site. So. None of them are like, you could have a game where neither of them are home, right? Like there are two schools that are not, that's not their own facility. So they do have to establish who's home and who's away. So that's, that would make sense. And that's what we already talked about this. Like if you're in a tournament or something, then you, yes, you need like to establish that. I think what we were saying was more like you're working a game where schools travel like three, four hours and, and you're like, hey, you're away. And they're like, yeah, we know. Right. Obviously. Obviously. We're 
for a way. So yeah, that was that was from that was from PJ. But we had we had some more here, Nathan. Yeah, we had uh, Jonathan from Jefferson City, Missouri, sent in a couple questions, and the first one was one he just really liked the pregame conversations. Some very interesting ones. Um, this one actually wasn't even part of the conversation, but it's actually when he flipped the coin. You know, the question is when are we supposed to ask for them to call it? You know, especially when it's in, already in the air, they forget. Now what? And it hits what the ground, and they're staring at you. Yeah, like the scenario that he, yeah, exactly. That's the scenario that he painted. And I think we've, for those of you that are referee for any length of time, we've probably had that. Oh, yeah. It's just a very, very awkward moment of silence where we all just stand there and go, now what? Yeah, they're like, Dude, you were supposed to call something in the air. Or the other one, and this wasn't in one that Jonathan had said, but where they'll be like, hey, uh, say red or blue, and then you toss it, and they go, tails! You know, that wasn't an option. Well, you lost. <laughs> it's your choice. That's right, yeah. yeah. So that was that was one of the things that Jonathan wrote in about. The other one that he was talking about was kind of a less funny thing. Yeah, so the first one, you know, was more towards the players. This one is more towards your crew of referees, in regards to when you're talking to them, kind of what, what exactly should you say, what looks good, what helps you guys get on the same page. I think saying DFU is probably not going to help the case. Um, yeah. What exactly are we supposed to do with that? And, you know, how does that make me become a better referee for today's match? How does it help me help you? Right. Yeah. And for those that don't know what DFU means, um, it means don't fudge up. But fudge is a different word, a naughty word. Naughty, naughty word. That's, so we want to avoid that. But I love, Jonathan, I love the way, and I said this to you when, when I wrote back. But he goes... Well, sorry, bud. I average about 2.98 ups a game. Anything under three today, and I'm considering that a win. Uh, that would be the perfect response, John, and that is fantastic. So I, we would agree with you. It's probably, unless these are like your two best friends that you're working with, if you're working with any, anybody that you don't know, especially newer, younger officials, probably need to scratch that from our pregame vocabulary. Yeah, I feel like you can add a little bit more to really help yourself in that situation. Um, it makes for a funny story, but it doesn't really help you for the game. It's true. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. And then Scott Dyer from Wichita, Kansas, wrote in and had a couple of different ideas based on back from when episode one we were talking about uh, law rule changes, and he had a couple proposed ideas. I thought these were interesting. So the first one was um, each coach gets one timeout per half, so that is the only time they're allowed to address their field players during active play. So he said, the rationale for this is you coach slash teach during training, and the game is the test. Let the players play and see how well they do on their test. This would also help alleviate the yelling and screaming from the Southern, which so often negatively impacts players. Okay. Kind of an interesting concept. Very much so. It would definitely change the dynamic and the speed of the game. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure, if you're going to a timeout type situation. But, you know, this could also help with advertising, the, those games that are televised. They're always trying to work in the advertisement, you know. Maybe bring in a media timeout while we're at it. Why, why not? Might as, might as well. I'm, why not? Yes, brought to you by Lunchables or whatever. Yeah, Lunchables. Um, and then the second one is a suggestion for overtime or, or extra periods. So follow follow this, because it took me a, I had to reread this a couple times. Um, I went to public school, though, so that's why it took forever. But I play a maximum of two 10-minute periods. If nobody scores, the game ends in a tie unless a winner is required and this go to penalty kicks. However, this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so buckle up, all right? If you haven't had enough coffee, maybe this is another reason why you need to pause the video. Go drink some coffee, come back, and get ready for this next part, because it gets a little hairy. If one team scores in the first overtime period in the third minute, for example, then immediately switch sides and play for an additional three-minute period. If no time goal is scored after three minutes, the game is over. If a time goal is scored the first minute of the second overtime period, for example, then keep playing. If nobody else scores after three minutes, it's a tie. If the game is tied and somebody scores again between the first and third minutes of the second overtime period, then the game is over. Golden goal. So basically he's saying it gives you, as he says, this ensures... Both teams get equal treatment over time period, especially when the elements come into play, such as, as he mentions, directional wind. Kind of interesting, kind of hard to follow there, but that's a, it's a fascinating concept. And there's a lot going on here. Um, I think it kind of tries to answer a couple questions in regards to overtime with both high school and college soccer. Right. Um, you know, trying to give both teams the same equal opportunity in regards to, especially in this situation, with weather, you know, wind, rain, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, but yeah, I think it could lead to more attacking soccer. Some, True. Some maybe quick goals, some high offense. Which in overtime sometimes you just got some tired legs, so it could really change things up. That's true. It could. Interesting thoughts. Thank you to those who have weighed in. We want to hear more from you. So if you have other comments or suggestions, or would like to reflect on some of the other segments we've had in previous episodes, we'd still love to hear from you. Uh, slide into our DMs on social media, Instagram and Twitter at check underscore complete, or send us an email, questions at checkcompletepodcast.com. We are super excited to have uh, Heather Cribs with us today. Heather, you were in, you had the misfortune of being in my class <laughs> back in February. Um, no, so February, middle of February that you got certified. And then I heard back from you a, a few weeks later, well, about a month later, right? Uh, you sent me an email and we actually published this for those of you that have been following us on the podcast, you've on uh, social media, we published out a copy of her email that was, get, you were getting ready to work a big a game and you were wondering, hey, what do I need to do to be prepared for this? And so we wanted to follow back up with Heather to see how that game went, what it's been like since then. You've been, we were talking a little before we started recording that you've been reffing quite a bit. So um, tell us a little about, you, you reached out to me and you were getting ready to do what? So um, we were traveling to a showcase tournament in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I had only been an assistant referee, which I think is definitely a great place to start. Um, and I had told the assigner, like, hey, I only want an assistant ref. I'm still really new. Um, but he had assigned me um, some center ref positions. And I was getting ready to center ref a U17 college uh, showcase game. So I felt like he kind of threw me to the deep end, which is why I reached out because I was like, I don't even know what to expect. Um, I have a, a U17 player um, and these boys are huge. I'm five foot four, so they're all bigger than me. <laughs> I can't see over them. So I, I really just wanted some advice before I started that game. Um, so I went into it super nervous. <laughs> Uh, terrified actually because I know how aggressive that age group can be um, and then it being a showcase you know I've only been a parent I've uh, played a couple like adult league games but I don't feel like that counts so <laughs> um, right absolutely yeah so there's that that is 100% getting thrown into the fire right there um, right out of the chute that, that is pretty amazing. So yeah, you got your feet with some, with some assistant referee things. And so then, and so you emailed me with that and we published that and we got a lot of really great responses. And so we just wanted to hear back from you and I had reached back out with you. We've exchanged a little bit of a few messages, but I just wanted to hear what that experience was like for you. And then if there were things that you learned from that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> teenage, teenage boys. Um, so I went into that super nervous. Um, it went well, my first game went well. Um, they were very clean for the most part. So it really went and the parents were quiet, coaches were good. Um, so that game really wasn't that bad, but I had another game, a, a second game that was way more intense. I think these teams had played each other before um, and they were playing at a little bit higher level. And so, First half, we're going along great. I'm thinking, oh, this is good. I've got good rapport with the players. I'm kind of talking to them on the field. Um, and then I missed a couple of calls. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, fouls, parents were losing their minds on the sideline. <laughs> I got coaches yelling. Um, and then, of course, the players start talking to not like super mouthy, but, you know, they they get a little sassy. Um, so it was a foul. The kid had come in. Um, it was shoulder to shoulder at first, but it was a hard 50 50 challenge. And so I let it go. And these are big kids. Um, and the one kid did kind of drop his shoulder, but it, nobody, nobody went down. Nobody got hurt. They kept the ball. So I just let it play. <laughs> and the parents were losing it. So, um, that I think started the downhill decline in that game. Um, and then I missed, uh, the ball went out, 
mind you, my 13 year old is the AR on one side, who's also a new ref. And then I've got a kid on the other side who was assistant refing. So there was nobody really there to help me. Um, no experience on the sidelines. And uh, I missed which direction the ball went out. Um, it kind of bounced off two players. I couldn't see it. I really don't think my AR was paying attention. <laughs> and so um, it just kind of escalated from there. <laughs> Uh, and then what else happened? There was one more foul. It was a pretty hard challenge. Both the boys went down and it kind of looked like they were fighting on the ground, but you couldn't really tell. And so I carded, I carded the player and sent him off. Um, it just is a yellow, but I carded him and sent him off because I was like, we need to take a timeout. Basically, I need you to go away. <laughs> um, and then my AR was like, they, they weren't fighting. Like it was, um, and so I had gotten flustered at that moment and I gave the ball to the wrong team. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so there's probably like five minutes, 10 minutes maybe left in the game. Um, and from there it was like a downhill slide because I'm already flustered. Everybody was yelling. Um, so I, so when I gave the ball to the wrong team, um, I had to ask all of the parents to be quiet because I couldn't hear my AR, what he was trying to tell me. And I had walked over to him um, and the players too were kind of yelling like, no, it should be our ball. Um, that's the wrong team. Like they weren't doing anything. And I'm like, uh, so I was like super flustered <laughs> in that moment. And uh, it, it just wasn't good from there. So that was a bad experience. I was super upset because I felt bad for myself. Um, the game, I mean, the coaches weren't upset at the end of the game. So that was good, I guess. I think I was probably way harder on myself than I should have been, but we were right next to the parents. Um, and so, and they had been kind of loud the whole game. And I think that kind of just added to the frustration and my like, me being flustered. And, and then when you got a, a little kid who's like, you know, five foot nothing as your AR and you're like, but he knows the game has been playing for a decade. It just kind of made me lose confidence in myself too. And, and maybe the players did too, but um, that game ended and my other AR who had been, he's refed, but he's still, like I said, a kid, he was like, are you going to quit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. he was like he's like you look like you're done and I was like I, I don't know right now I do feel a little done <laughs> sure so um uh, luckily I didn't have to center off the rest of that tournament thank goodness <laughs> and uh I didn't quit I kept refing um and I refed a couple tournaments <laughs> since then and so um I had reached out to some people that I knew locally that have refed for a long for a longer time um and just kind of tried to run some scenarios by them and get some advice um and luckily it's gotten better so I refed um a tournament in Kansas City uh U14 and below it was like U14s I refed a U10 final that was like super intense and um Everything went great. I <laughs> didn't have any issues. I gave a coach a warning because he was yelling at me, gave a parent a warning, but for the most part, I had control of the whole game. No issues. They had like, a, I don't know if it was the assigner, somebody else was standing because it was a final. Um, no issues. He's like, you did a great job. You had control of the game. You were calling it fair both ways. You're calling all the things you should. Um, so I've gotten better, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> And then, um, so I, I definitely like refing the younger kids. The parents are a little crazier, mm -hmm. uh, but I actually think I like refing the U14 and below because you can still kind of direct those players like, hey, you know, tell the keeper, like you can bring it all the way out to the line. Like, that's okay. You can kind of help them like, hey, I called this because this is what you did. Um, to kind of give them an idea. Whereas the older kids that are like 16, 17, they don't care what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very good. They're like, whatever, lady, we don't care. And so, um, <laughs> so I think I kind of, and I prefer kids smaller than me. I think it's intimidating refing giant boys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's when you're five foot. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So, and the guy, the guy's like, didn't you see that? I'm like, no, you're six foot two. I can't see over you and I can't see through you. I didn't see it. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, awesome. That is awesome. Well, I, there's so many thoughts that kind of come to my head and I <laughs> do want to ask you, but um, just in reflection, but I love, first of all, we're super proud of you for jumping into that. I mean, on behalf of the whole soccer referee community, that's fantastic. And there are people, I know that there are people that have refereed for two or three years that would say, nope, not even, I, you know what? I'm not even going to show up in Dallas, you know, but you went <laughs> did it, right? You went out and did it. And, and uh, what an amazing experience. And, and for your courage to be able to talk about this too is fantastic. And, and, there's been many that have been in your shoes I and mean, we can recount our first few times. And, and even now, like when you move up into different levels, you remember those first few times and we can relate to where you're like, Oh my word, should I be here? I don't belong here. I don't do this. So <laughs> I'm super, super thankful that you um, were willing to talk to us about this, but also just really proud of you for getting out there and doing it. I think that that is incredible. Um, that you had that experience and have, well, you lived to talk about it, right? Right. So, yeah. I survived and I came back. <laughs> that's right. And that's something that quite honestly is kind of, it, we joke around about it, but for, for a lot of our new referees, even referees, any, any place on the journey to go, you know what, the game's going to end. I'm going to survive. And then what can I, what can I take from this? Um, you know, so I know there's the, the one question that we were really curious that I, and I'm going to pose this when we have our interview with, with Corey, um, is knowing what you know now, okay, um, after doing some tournaments and, and obviously been watching soccer a long time and that kind of thing, but knowing what you do know now as, as a referee, um, you know, what, two months in, what would, what do you wish you could go back and tell yourself before you got into these tournaments or before you even got into that game in Dallas? <laughs> right. Um, I think the one thing, and you said it in class was be confident in your decisions when you make them. Um, I think that was part of it. Like I didn't blow my whistle loud enough. Like I sounded really unsure of myself, um, which, you know, just fed into the chaos that was already going on in that game. <laughs> so definitely be confident, um, blow your whistle louder, but for whatever reason, how loud you blow your whistle makes a difference in, you know, the players and the coaches and the parents' confidence in your just in your calls. Um, that sounds silly, but it's definitely true. Um, and I've seen that since. The other thing I would say is uh, ask for experienced refs to be with you. <laughs> like, I don't think it's a good idea to throw three, two young ARs, one being very new and a new center into a game like that. That's just probably not a good idea. <laughs> So, right. um, and maybe I should have spoke up and been like, hey, I'm not ready for this. Uh, but that's definitely one thing that's helped since is being able to ref with other experienced referees. That's probably helped me learn the most. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. Great advice. Absolutely. Thoughts yeah. that you'd like to in reflection or? No, I think those are great. Um, I think a lot of uh, what even now, you know, we've been doing this for way too many years that we can count and we're still <laughs> learning from people every single time we work a game and learning from way more experienced referees. And we've, you know, would love just to keep learning from them every single time. Um, I think you did a great job. Good for you for getting back out there again, continuing to learn, continuing to get better. Like you said, confidence is a huge thing. So um, I just applaud you for doing that. I applaud you for Thanks. traveling. I mean, you're already traveling way more than I ever did in my first couple of years of refereeing games. So I yeah, I mean, I don't really have a choice about that. The boys are traveling to play. And so I'm like, well, I might as well make some money to offset some of this because soccer's expensive. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah, absolutely. So the takeaways I, that I would say, especially if, if there are new referees that are, are watching this or listening to this, is like he's like we talked about the confidence piece is is huge and um another uh instructor that i um work with quite frequently i may have mentioned this in class or not but his his line he said i've been to almost every grocery store in town and i can't find confidence on the shelf anywhere and, uh, <laughs> and so that isn't something that necessarily comes naturally but understanding okay like you said um you know what this is the role that i find myself in today I'm going to puff my chest out a little bit and blow the whistle a little bit louder than I think I need to. 
and carry myself with that posture. And then, you know, after the game, that's the part where you're going to go, Whoa. okay, right. <laughs> what, what could I have done better? What can I do differently? What scenarios? And then the other thing, so the confidence piece, but the other thing that you've mentioned that's huge is being able to have the people like that you've reached out to, to connect with the people in your local area um, is huge. Those people that you run into and rub shoulders with on, on a frequent basis to be able to say, Hey, I got something I got to run past you. You know, it's funny. We do that. We've got our little text groups or things like that, where if we can get a video, it's even better, right? You know, Hey, right. this, did I really screw this one up or did, you know, did I get it right? Or how could we handle things differently? So that's, that's wonderful, which I know is not always the case for you know, new officials at games, but nowadays more and more things are being videotaped. So maybe there, there's a place for that. So anyway, well, I don't want to take too much more of your evening, but we really appreciate you chatting with us and sharing about a little bit about your story. We are thankful that you stayed with it. <laughs> and uh, we hope just, we wish you the absolute best as you move forward and, uh, and have more and more experiences. And if we can be a resource for you, just like you found people in your neck of the woods, don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, feel free to keep sending us emails. Keep sending us, you know, situations too. We love those. We will analyze situations all day long. <laughs> Great. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Absolutely. you bet. You bet. We're excited to have FIFA Assistant Referee and NISOA Senior Director of Education, Corey Rockwell, with us today. Corey, thanks for so much for taking time to be with us. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. So we really, before we get started into a couple different things, uh, one big one being NISOA's recent publishing of the educational plan and where that's going, we're excited to hear a little bit more about that from you. We just want to get kind of in the way of introduction to hear a little bit more about you. And so just where are you from? What do you do? I mean, outside of soccer, however much information you're willing to volunteer, we are happy to listen to it. Yeah, no problem. Sometimes the uh, the other stuff uh, elicits some questions or, oh, hey, oh, I didn't know you did that or this. So, um, yeah, I can, I'm more than happy to start with that. So I am in now my 32nd year of being a referee. Um, so I'm definitely one of the old guys. I don't think it's long is as long as Fotis Bazakos and some of the others, but it's definitely, it's definitely, or, or Brian Cohen, you know, being a little, a little more local to, uh, to Kansas there. So, um, but yeah, 32nd year as a referee. Um, I've been on the FIFA list. Um, well, my goodness, since 20, since 2007. So this is the year 16 on the list. Uh, Jair and I came on together. And I think right now we're on the U.S. longevity record for a number of years on, on, the, on, on the FIFA list. So been been there quite some time. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, spent most of my uh, life there, went to school at Georgia Tech. And then I work for uh, Clorox and they got bought by Dial, you know, Dial Soap. And uh, because of that transition, I made my way out to Arizona, moved due to work. And I've been in Arizona for the past 17 years now. So um, my previous job I was with between Clorox, Dial and others for 18 years. And it was it was tough. I was the head of internal audit for North and South America. And I was going to, which sounds great, traveling all over the world. Some places were amazing, like South Korea. Uh, I went to Germany. I went to South Africa, all for 21 days straight. But then I also went to some places like Kazakhstan, Belarus, which uh, for, you don't want to spend 28 days in the middle of winter in Belarus. That's 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 for sure. <laughs> so that got very tough. I decided I need a job a little closer to here. So for the past three years, I've been the head of internal audit for PF Chang's at their corporate office here in Scottsdale. So that's what I do outside and for uh, work. Um, and then I have three boys, age 13, 11, and 7, that, uh, that keep me busy and pretty much prevent me from having any hobbies outside of soccer and work is just, uh, you know, getting home as quickly as, can, as I can to them to see their soccer games or their hip hop dance uh, classes or help them with homework or whatever the case may be. Wow, that is interesting. Very cool. Well, I'll have to talk offline about this P.F. Chang's connection. Oh, <laughs> ideal, deal. <laughs> if you have trouble, probably if you have trouble with any of their restaurants near you, you just let me know, and well, I'll I'll make some phone calls. <laughs> so far, so good with the one in the plaza in Kansas City, but I'll keep good. that. Yes, yes, happy to hear. Yeah, very, very good. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, that that helps. Uh, I mean, it's everybody's a, a person. Right. And yeah. so um, we, we talked a little bit about that before we started recording about just how it's easy to dehumanize those that were um, that were the, you know, hold the flag, carry the whistle, all that kind of stuff. But right. everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a family. Everybody's got something that 
keeps them ticking. And so it's, it's cool Absolutely. hearing that with us. But so let's just jump in on the NISOA side of things. Yeah. Uh, get started. And then we'll move into a little bit more about your career and some of our fan questions. So on the NISOA side of things, uh, for those that are NISOA officials, National Intercollegiate Soccer Officials Association, for those who are not working at that level, um, first of all, I hope you aspire to work at that level. It's a lot of fun to do that. So that's a great place to, to continue to work in the game. But let's talk a little about that. For those that are part of NISOA, you guys sent out that information. So we've already seen that come through and we're beginning to start planning. But um, kind of where was that born from? What uh, What's the plan and, and how can we access that? A lot of information. So I'll just let you run with that. Yeah, no, Gordy, I'll address your first point first, which is, uh, you know, just aspiring to get in the nice. So back in Georgia, and he's like, you know what, you'd be a good candidate to, to start doing college soccer, you were solid in this game. And you never know when who you're going to work with or, or who's watching you. And that's how I got into NISO originally, you know, decades ago. Um, but now speaking about the uh, the webinars coming up, um, we wanted to give some um, the members something. Um, well, let me back up a little bit. We asked our members first, you know, what do you think about webinars? And the and the response was overwhelmingly positive. It's their it's it's a member's most favorite form, you know, just like this podcast of, of activity. It's convenient. It's uh, you don't have to spend money on airfare or travel or anything like that. Um, it's, and it's a very efficient way to deliver the content. We were a little afraid of webinar um, exhaustion. Um, and maybe there was a little of that during the pandemic, but I think people are still really enjoying those. So we wanted to give the NISO members something during the off season. So we have four planned, one in April, two in May and one in June, um, I believe is the schedule. And the one we're gonna start with in April is uh, phys is uh, phys physical fitness and preparation for the fitness test and staying in shape in the off season. So Jonathan Weiner, who owns a gym in Florida, he's going to give us some uh, some training tips there. And uh, I think it's going to be a good one, about 45 minutes in length. We'll do more educational in May. And then we're going to have our first in-person clinic in June since the pandemic. Uh, we're, we're teaming up with the Texas uh, with the Texas chapter there. And we're going to look to have a session June. I think it's June 19th. Well, I, I know that exact date is out there. But it'll be an all-day clinic. And then we're going to get a group, uh, a group of box, a group of tickets to the FC Dallas game that night where we can all watch the game together. And I guess maybe that looks at the historical pieces. You know, back in December, we had our first ever women's summit with Carrie Seitz, who's arguably one of the greatest women's uh, referees in, in the world um, as our speaker. We flew her in from, uh, from, from FIFA headquarters in Zurich, and she came and she spoke to us, which was unbelievable. Um, and both the night before we had gone to the final four games and people said, just being able to sit there and talk informally to me, to Amanda Ross, uh, Lance and some of the others there was just so fantastic to be able to chat informally during a game and why they do that. Why did she give advantage there? Uh, why did he raise the flag there? Why is some positioning? So we figured the FC Dallas game would be a good way to do that for, uh, and look at some pro referees there. So, and staying on the women's summit, we will be repeating that this year. I can go ahead and announce that you're getting a sneak preview here on on the uh, on, on on this podcast. So that will be in Cary, North Carolina, the weekend of I think it's December second through fourth, which also coincides with the Women's College Cup again. It's not just for women referee; it's referees. It's for it's for all genders, and I think the the guys that attended this past December got a ton out of it uh, because quality referee instruction is is good no matter who it comes from. And um, but once again, we're going to search the world. And I have a few candidates in mind. Uh, they, were, they will most likely be another international top name coming in December. So stay tuned for that. Wow, <clears throat> that's awesome. I did see some posts from the Women's Summit and it, it, it was just glowing responses and, and reactions from it. That's fantastic. Yeah, really nice, really nice. We appreciate, and I mentioned this off air, I'm going to just say it while we're recording here. We do really appreciate, especially in Kansas City, and I know with other NISO officials I've talked to, all the work that you guys have put into this, a lot of that is just, it comes from, it comes from really, I, you can tell from your guys' hearts, just the people that you are. And so we're grateful for your leadership in that and uh, excited to see where NISOA continues to go. I think it's been amazing to see, as I mentioned, I've been in about five or six years to see it continue to grow is really, really exciting. So we'll keep those on our calendar. We will put, uh, for those that are engaging with us on YouTube here, we will put those comments, uh, we'll put those links in the description of the video, that way it's accessible for you. But if you're not already engaging on the portal, please do that. Uh, check with your local chapter leadership if you're an ISO official and you don't know what I'm talking about. 
uh, well, send me a DM or something. We can get you. <laughs> but check with your local chapter leadership. Make sure you're engaging on the portal. There's a lot of really good stuff that's being shared through that. Mark Cahan's been doing a lot of video education through it that has been fantastic. And so if you're not engaging with the portal, please, please do that. Definitely. So is there anything else on that I saw aside that like, if you don't share this with us before we switch to this, you're not gonna be able to sleep tonight. Like, is there anything? No, else? no, that's okay. There, one big thing is there, this is a rules change here for the NCAA. So uh, that's why we kind of paused the, the webinars at June. Then we're going to wait and see kind of what comes from the NCAA. And then we'll have a, a in-season webinars once again this year uh, coming up. So they're not going to end in June. This is more just what we want to do during the off season to keep members engaged and, and keep the education and, and, uh, and fitness going before that first kick of uh, a fall season comes around in, in, in early August. It's awesome. Yeah, we, we did talk a little bit about the proposed changes and we're hoping, I think we've been in conversation. Hopefully we'll have Rich Grady come join us to talk about those when those get. Uh, oh, that'd be great. Great. Yeah, he'd be a great guest from, from all aspects, not just NCA, but his refereeing career and everything else. Yeah, we would we'd love to connect with him. So, um, but so let's just transition now. Appreciate all, all that you've talked about with NISO. We're excited for what's coming. Uh, let's transition now to, we've had some audience questions to just talk sure. about you, you, your career and the, the path that you've been on. Before we get into those questions, you've already alluded to it, but maybe talk to us a little about your path. I love hearing those stories and a lot of our listeners have, have really appreciated that and can connect with your story in different ways. So just give us maybe just the very Reader's Digest version of, of you know, how you started and where you've gotten to today. Yeah, Reader's Digest. I think I, I knew I wanted to be a referee early. I, I would skip, uh, when, I won't say skip classes, but I had to pay for my own college. So the way I did that was through refereeing. Um, and yes, sometimes I'd have to uh, skip a class or two or turn in homework late because I was doing two varsity high school games the night before and gone on, and on the field for five or six hours. So um, I made the nationals in 98. And then, hey, things don't always go perfect. I thought I was going to have my national badge a year after. And, you know, things, uh, life happened, work work happened, et cetera. Um, so recalibrated. And then um, I was at a tournament in 2004, I believe it is, uh, Amateur Nationals. And I made it there as a center referee. And, um, and I, I won't sh retell the whole story because you heard it already, Gordy, at, at the coaches convention. Um, but long story short, I, even though I made it as a referee, I decided in that tournament that I wanted to be an assistant referee. I um, uh, there were a few ARs there, uh, you know, my skill set was more toward that. I love being the co-pilot and looking, making the team look good as I do, you know, being, being the center. So I, so I, I think my skill set was, was, it was good to be an AR, you know, and people have seen me sprint. I had a pretty good sprinting ability back 20 years ago, and I still have, a, have a little bit of a, of a kick there, but, uh, uh, but yeah, and that, that was another key benefit is that I can stay with that second to last defender, um, as, as well, which, which, which always helped a lot so since then and then just went from there and uh 346 mls games later i'm still still at it and uh and you know i, I still get a thrill out of blowing the whistle i still blow the whistle on sundays i still blow the whistle during college season and for me it's so important as an ar and that's some of the top advice i give is that hey once you choose that quote-unquote ar track don't stop blowing the whistle. You still need to know what good support is. You still need to know what you like to get from ARs and what you don't like from ARs. You still need to know what a foul is in the center to be and to feel what it's like to be uh, to be within the touch line. So I think that's been one of the greatest um, um, assets for me is, to, is that I've kept blowing the whistle even with the, the FIFA AR badge. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great advice. I mean, you can never stop being a referee in the middle. You got to really understand what the game is all about, even when you're on the line. So I think it's that's exactly. great advice. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So this question comes to us from Brendan, uh, one of our uh, former co-hosts. Yes. <laughs> he knows his place now. No. Um, anyway, so... How does your referee crew approach games where there is a language barrier between referees and, and players and, and technical staff? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I've done a lot of Spanish speaking games, obviously, throughout throughout the years, and I've definitely picked up a nice little tool bag of, of key phrases, no more, no mas, take it easy, tranquilo, um, aquí, right here, when you tell them where to take the throw in here, aquí, aquí, back up. So I have a few, you know, four to six phrases that really help, for, uh, you know, when I am refereeing teams that only know Spanish. But even outside that, 
Um, I know when Jair, you know, working with him, I've worked with him more than any other referee. And on the international stage, stage, even though he's fluent in Spanish and his parents were both born in Mexico, he doesn't speak Spanish on the international sp stage. He sticks to English. And it's so that he doesn't get it in prolonged conversations on the field. He, he speaks in English in very short phrases, and he wants to do the communication with his, with his whistle, with his pointing, and with his facial expressions. Now, it's not to say he doesn't want to talk to players. You can still communicate a lot through a smile, through a, through an angry look, et cetera. But, um, but you know, the, the international language, uh, common language is, is the whistle and, and, and the point. And, and I, while a few, key, a few key phrases definitely help, um, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it, it's a facial expressions that can really do a lot. And that, that transcends both from, like you said, Gordy, the college game where there are more and more, um, you know, Latin players all the way up through the international stage as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is applicable, like you said there, to anyone that yeah. has a different face. And I think that's great. We think, you know, internationally, oh, we got to wait to get to. No, you got to navigate cultures. And that's what makes soccer so beautiful is it brings together all of these cultures in such an interesting way. And, and so I think that that's that's super helpful for anybody at any point in their career as they continue to navigate. Um, you know, working with teams and, and, and clubs that are from different languages or cultures, backgrounds, things like that. Right. So, yeah. Now, that one World Cup game was, you know, when I was on the field it was Belgium versus uh, Tunisia. And, you know, Jair and I went out there not knowing either one of those languages, Belgian or, or, or Tunisian. So, but, but you look and, and the way Jair communicated, his facial expression, you know, um, he had, he had lighthearted moments with, with, with the, with the players. And one of my favorite moments is, uh, is when he had this, his key VAR, VAR check, you know, first call of the game was a penalty kick right on the line. He points his ear and say, he says, they said, excellent decision. And, you know, I'll, even though the players don't know English, he pointed to his ear and smiled and they knew he got the call right and they weren't, there was no point in arguing anymore. So, so this today have it another, you know, that's just an example of, you know, two languages we didn't know, but yet we were able to communicate just in little ways with the players. Well, speaking of the world cup. Yeah. So we actually had another question come in from Kyle from Boston. And oh, very good. Some more information in regards to your training for the world cup. What did that look like? How long did it last? Where was it? So yeah, go ahead and take that and run with it. Yeah, no problem. So the training for the World Cup really started. You know, they were looking at us how we're how we're doing in our domestic leagues and how we're doing in in uh, in, in the Concacaf games. And then once we were formally part of the World Cup process we would go to we would first our first uh um training seminar was a week long in dubai i think it was and we would take fitness tests and they would start to get us prepared this was the first world cup with var and every day we were doing 45 minutes of var drills um so we would rotate so they would hire local players every day and they would just do close offside decisions like the, the classic kick the ball defender running up attacker going forward and you'd have to make the decision and go quick and then we would rotate to the booth and we'd watch all five of our decisions as an AR and see how we went from there and then we rotate to the main field where they had an 11 v 11 game going on and they would do they would play and then all of a sudden someone would do a handball right on the line in the box and then we would have to communicate with the VAR and things like that so a lot of training from that standpoint there was a lot of classroom we we had we would spend an entire day on handball we'd spend an entire day on incidents in the box an entire day on positioning so we would do that for an entire week and very exhausting it sounds as, as exhausting it is no free time at all it was uh you know we weren't we weren't going to different restaurants it was eat together um eat together, classroom together, train together, and then right to bed and then re repeat the next morning for five to seven days. Once we did that, we then had a seminar in Italy um, and we got medical check. We had another fitness check. We continued to take tests. And then, uh, and then once we got to Russia, we got there about 10 days before the tournament and continued this same training. It was still VAR focused, make sure we know delay. It was get on the field and do 45 minutes in an actual mock game to, to try VAR and, and things like that. And, and one interesting fact, um, they actually had this mini, rep, they called it the FIFA referees tournaments and they hired local teams there in Russia. I shouldn't say hired, but local amateur teams signed up in Russia to play it so we could have players going at each other. Um, and then, you know, the USA crew would go referee one half. Then the, then the Mexico crew would, would referee the second half. And we'd have full VAR. We'd have 20 cameras, just like a real world cup game. 
but to incentivize the players to go at it, they gave the team the winner of this tournament fifteen thousand dollars. So they really wanted the teams to go at it. So it wasn't just, oh, these teams are just, you know, we're going to give them, uh, you know, uh, a, a bunch of Adidas balls, you know, as a thank you for playing. No, they were going at it. They wanted to win this tournament because 15 grand to 15 grand to a local amateur club is going to go quite a long way. So you can imagine that was quite a good test uh, leading up to the to the actual World Cup. Absolutely. That's really, really unique for those local amateur clubs. Um, just curious, is there a link to sign up for those tournaments? Yeah, <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. Yeah. for sure. For well, the next one's in. Uh, you know, maybe maybe you and I can uh, can look to get eleven aside together and, and and travel over to to Qatar in in October, November, and uh, and kick the ball around there for those referees. <laughs> Perfect. My best position is left bench. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, speaking of VAR, we talked with Jeff Swartzel about this in our last episode, and and he came in after VAR really had already been established in the MLS. You have been a part of the MLS through that whole going from no VAR to now where we're at. What has the introduction of VAR been like for you? Um, and maybe just, you know, personally or ARs in general, whichever way you'd like to go with that. Yeah, no, personally, I'd, I'd, I'll speak, uh, you know, give you another breaking stand, breaking news. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what Joe Fletcher from Pro said at the last AR camp, but I'll, I'll start with it by saying just I love VAR. It's it's an instant check. It's instant knowledge that we got the call right. Uh, and it kind of gives you a little pep in, uh, pep in your step to hear that you just nailed a close offside decision. I mean, I had a super close one. If you look at the second Cincinnati goal from yesterday, it was those classic one on one. There's one defender that didn't push up with everybody and he's starting to push up as this guy's going like that and thankfully he was dead even and Cincinnati scored a goal off it and I'm hesitating and I, I'm saying on the mic oh that that's a close one Jonathan you know let, I'll shut up and let you do your check but let me know and then we get the check complete it was like oh yes <laughs> and nailed that one so I absolutely love the AR it's it's uh it, it's it's uh it, it's it's great confirmation it has taken some um, adjustment, you know, obviously the, the the delay, you know, if it's something close, we don't want to take away a good goal because we misjudge an offside. And that's the reason why we let it play out like you did, like, like we do. So that's something that takes a little adjustment. But one interesting thing Joe Fletcher said is that with the advent of VAR, the one, one kind of disappointing thing is that the AR is now the third most important referee on the team. Mm. Referee number one, VAR number two, AR number three. And Joe said, Let's go back to the AR being the number two most important again. Let's let us let us let's totally, you know, I referee every game so that to obsolete VAR. And I love it when they say check complete and, you know, knock on wood. But so far, I haven't had a, a correct offside uh, overturned yet in, in, in MLS or international play. And, and that's 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 my goal every game is to really just nail those calls so that VAR doesn't get involved. And I think Joe makes an excellent point, Joe Fletcher. You know, let's 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 do to work the AR role back up let's let, let's let's uh you know let's obsolete VAR as much as we can not not get them involved on offside decisions and let's uh let's continue to support the team and get everything right on the field that we can and so yesterday was actually the uh well when we're recording this this we're recording it on Sunday yeah so whenever with this airs or whenever you're listening to this somewhere deep into the future who knows but yeah. um yesterday was the the first time you guys were the inaugural game with a centralized VAR correct yeah Correct. In, in Atlanta. So that was John, John Freeman and Jonathan Johnson were your VARs and AVARs there. And they were in Atlanta back in your, your homeland, right? Correct. Correct. Yep. So that, that it, it, it seemed to go well. Yeah, it seemed to go well. It is, uh, you know, we were worried about the delay uh, in talking. And of course, you're talking live to someone on your headset because you think about the other sports NBA baseball, they go to a bat phone to pick up the phone. It's a direct line to whoever they're talking to. We need that information in our ear. We don't have a phone we can that we can pick up and 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 call Atlanta to see whether we got a call right. We're talking to them live during the game. And it seemed to go well yesterday. John did a good job. He was communicating throughout, you know, giving Tori, you know, um, positive feedback uh, during the game. And it seemed to go seem to go really well. It is a little funny though, you know, you, if, if John is VAR for a game for let's say a sporting KC um, in the future, he's having to have to fly to Atlanta to be VAR for a game at, at sporting KC stadium, which seems kind of uh, backwards, but uh, I guess that, that, that's how it is. <laughs> Very good. That's great. Well, um, so we got to ask. Yes. Power squat. 
Yes. I, I've heard this before. I've heard you talk about it, but for those that haven't, uh, and we'll probably put up a picture so that everybody <laughs> knows, but we won't make you do this in your home office, but what, uh, right. where did this come from and, and, and all that? You know, I don't know when I started doing it, but I just kind of squatted a little bit and just kind of said, okay, I'm, I'm going to get super intense and I'm going to get the, I'm going to get in squat position. So in my opinion, it started as a fitness thing where I could turn and explode quickly. That That's the reason why it started. I'm not sure it has that benefit, but, um, you know, one thing I'll go back to Jair and sorry to mention him over and over, but I think you can substitute any, any referee. And one thing they love when they look over is if they see me squatting and like soup, it's it just like a, a little confidence for them that I'm focused, you know, it's not the lazy well, shoulders dropped, you know, the walking, if you look over and see your AR, there's no doubt that he or she is, 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 is in the game. And I think you're starting to see more and more ARs kind of start to adopt a little bit of, of a power squad. I mean, you can't be the OG in, in the, in, in the power squad, but uh, you know, some other things I was talking to a, uh, a referee who asked me about some of my mechanics of this. He was at the Cincinnati game last night and I said, you know, some of these, the assessors are going to yell at you on. When I first started doing this power squat thing, I was told, oh, you, you lose, you know, you lose the ability to stand tall and you can't see the field as well. And I thought, well, explain that to a five foot one referee that they can't see the field as well. You know, I, I, I don't think shorter referees are, are, are less qualified. So I think I can judge an offside line just as well, whether my eyes are here or here. Um, but I said, another one you'll hear from assessors is you'll see me do this a lot when the, when the ball is right on the line and it's close. I'm like, no, it's in, it's in. Everyone looks at me and they know right away I'm looking at it and I'm involved. And that's a negative hand signal that assessors will slap you on the wrist for, but I continue to do. And the one thing he, he picked up on last night was that when I have a, a close offside decision, if I'm sidestepping and there's a player offside, um, oh, I have a flag here. I got an old school flag. I'll, I'll kind of put both hands on the flag like this. So if I'm going, I'm like this. And he's like, why do you put both hands on the flag when you have someone in an offside decision? I said, well, early in my career, if it was one hand, I'd be too quick to go like this. But if I have two hands on it, it's like both. It's like this one can control this hand and not go too quick. They both have to make a conscious decision to go up with the flag so I'm, that I'm not raising it too too quickly. And he's like, I'm going to try that next game because I've been accused of having a happy flag as well. So um, that's another little I, I guess I have a few techniques that uh, they don't teach you in, in, in the classroom, but I've seen to, to have uh, to have adapted into my game. <laughs> well, I love that. And I, I think that's great. If you're watching this or listening to this and you are a newer referee, I, one of the things that we talk about out with the referees when we go out and mentor at the, the youngest ages is one of the things that frustrates parents more than anything is the, the look of apathy on a fish right. that are just there for the paycheck. And so not only reassuring the rest of your crew that you're engaged, but reassuring those around you that I'm, I'm involved. I'm here to keep your kids safe today and, uh, and all of that. I think that's huge. So that's not just something that's kind of a funny thing, but it really, you're right. And I love that, that even Jair, a referee that's, you know, that season to been around the game for so long, that provides a little bit of a oomph. I think that's, that's such a neat perspective, Corey. I appreciate it. Exactly. That. And I was kind of thinking about dropping it. And then, uh, someone asked Jair about it, like, Hey, what do you think about Corey doing the squatting thing? You know, do you, can you still see him when he's, I mean, he was actually asking, can you still see him when he, when he squats down like that? You know, is he kind of hidden when he does that? He's like, uh, heck no. I, he's like, when I look over him, I know I don't have to worry about Corey's side because he's, he's laser focused. He's in. And ever since he said that, I'm like, all right, no, I'm not dropping this. I'm, 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 I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm going to stop watching MLS if you stop power squatting. So <laughs> the MLS is terrified. They're going to lose my viewership now. So yeah. Anyway. Ethan, you had a, we have just a couple more questions and, and then we'll let you go, Corey. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So you were talking about, you know, the approved mechanics that you have seemed to alter. Um, yeah. But in regards to that, going back to the beginning of your time, if you could talk to first year, first month, you know, brand new Corey Rockwell referee, what kind of advice would you have for yourself now that you've learned over the years and over your experience? Yeah, I think the one thing I kind of alluded to this earlier, but I wanted the I wanted a whistle in MLS as quickly as possible. I wanted it now. Brian Hall had it when I was 20, when he was 25. I, you know, why can't I have it when I'm 25? And I can't imagine the referee I'd be today if I would have gotten into MLS in 1999 instead of 2005. Um, I still had a lot more growing to do. Um, there's so much with, with experience. And um, and while I thought it was the end of the world that I didn't get an MLS shot, 
spot or or a national badge, you know, back early in my career, it, it actually worked out. For, I wish I could have told Corey Rockwell that, hey, be patient, be patient, keep learning, keep at it, keep keep doing as as many games as as, as possible, get on the field as much as possible, and and good things will 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 happen from there. And and I've always kept a, a good attitude, as 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 many know. I've always um, I've always tried to to do the balance of work, family, and and soccer because if you're if you have a work uh, uh, a work issue and you're leaving it to do go referee a soccer game, you're not going to be in the right frame of mind to referee that that soccer game. If you're worried about family or work in the back of your mind, you're not going to be 100 percent focused. So um, so I have had to turn big assignments back, you know, due to um, due to work or due to family. And at the time, I thought it was oh. I'm never going to get a call again. And this is it. And I would tell the Corey then, Hey, it'll all work out. You know, you know, it'll, it'll all, it'll all be for, it'll all be for the best. You're doing the best for, 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 for your situation now. And that's, that's, that's all, that's all you can do. So I think those are the two bits of advice I, I would give uh, a younger Corey Rockwell. And I said this in Kansas City, probably cut, I'd cut my hair too, because I had hair down to here um, uh, back for the first 10 years I was a referee, you know, it was the old tuck behind the ear skater look. Um, and maybe I would have cut it a little earlier. In fact, I think there's a picture of me from nationals where literally the, the, the hair is like covering, partially covering one eye as I'm, as I'm pointing in my fuchsia Jersey on the, on the under 17 final. So maybe I would have gotten a little more professional haircut before going to nationals. That'd be maybe one minor thing I, I would do as well. <laughs> yeah, I think having some hair in your eyes may not help with your rapport a little bit, but no, <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. And, and it kept me that young look. And I get asked so many times at amateur games on Sunday. I was like, oh, is, 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 is your mom gonna, is your mom here watching the game too? You know, thinking I'm young. I was like, well, actually she is. She's up in the stands right over there. You know, <laughs> actually she is. Yeah. <laughs> That's too good. That's too good. So you've already, you know, you talked about the advice you'd give yourself. Is there advice? I mean, the question I'm asking that we were asked in, in uh, to relay to use, what's the best advice you've been given so those advice for yourself, but has there been those in your life that have spoken truth into you over the years? Yeah, I think I've kept the same mentors and they've they really kept me grounded over over the decades. And really, I think good advice is if you like something someone's doing, then try to copy it. Try to try to have it have it try to uh, try to incorporate on a few games. You know, maybe if it's a state cup semifinal and you're trying some for the first time, that may not be the, the the best the best time to use it. But experiment. You know, I remember when I was on a high school game and there's a referee that had two whistles, one for subs and one for fouls. So like, that's a really good idea. You got to kind of, kind of got the soft tweet, tweet and, 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 and the sharp whistle for fouls. Like I'm going to try that. So I, for my next JV game, I got my, my Fox 40 and my, uh, I don't even know what the other one was, the, the quieter whistle and just started playing with that. You know, how, how could I switch between the two whistles quite quickly in, in the run of play and got used to that? You know, do I do one hand, one on the right hand, one on the left, you know, how do I position them? Um, and then even AR mechanics, um, you know, just trying little things like backing off the line to open up my, my field of view and, and little things like that. I would just, I would just see others do it and then try to incorporate it in, into, into my game. So I think that's really a big one. And, and I don't think I, you know, some states have a mentorship program, but you don't have to wait for a formal program to pick your mentors, you know, find, find people you look into and look up to pick their brain and, uh, and, and really start to incorporate some of their, some of their best practices. Is that, that that you see because it could work for you as well it's great any closing thoughts for the check complete podcast listeners oh any final thoughts no maybe i'll i'll give uh um no this, this has been really good i mean it, it's been a great career i'm obviously coming towards the end of my on-field career which is why i'm kind of a little bit of a transition to, into into in, instructing it's i think it's good to have an an instructor uh, and the senior director of instruction that's still refereeing it's why tori is so powerful to be in her position with nice same with lance because they're both still on the field doing it as well so um but i am i am coming toward toward the end of the career unfortunately i, will, I don't have another 15 years left in me in, in mls i I don't think, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, one thing that's, that's kept the longevity so long is that just, uh, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's the ability just to, to, to stay mentally and physically sharp. And once, once my last game ends for college season or pro season that I start training literally the, the next day for the, for the next year's fitness test, you know, and that's, that's really keeping at it. And mentally, I, you know, I touched on this earlier, but I, I've touched, I've, I've turned back some big events. I've, I turned down a 2020, uh, uh, a U 20 world cup, believe it or not, um, just because I'd work in, in personal priorities and I knew I wouldn't be able to hundred percent give four to five weeks of my time and do it correctly. I might've missed, lost some oppor other opportunities, but in the long run, it was best for my career. And I eventually got, got to Russia for that. So um, even, even despite that, so that that's really a big one. I'd say just keep it, keep it, keep the work life good, keep the family life good, keep the personal life good. And, uh, and it'll translate to, to good things on the field and always stay positive. And uh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's, you know, it's uh, it's not just about doing, doing the best in, in the, in the tops games, you never know who is watching. I'll, I'll reemphasize that that piece, whether it's a U14 game or a, or a college game or a, or a high school game. You never know who's going to be watching you. Maybe has a connection to give you that next opportunity. So, um, so yeah, always always support the team. Always look good and uh, always always treat this game like it's the most important game of the day to you and to those players. Absolutely, Corey. Thank you so much for your time. We really really appreciate you spending a few minutes with us, and I know our listeners and viewers are grateful for it. We've had a lot of people that are excited for this interview. So they're, uh, it's always good to, to, to hear from you and to gain some, some valuable words of wisdom. So we appreciate it. Awesome. Looking forward to seeing you on the, on the NISO webinars. Thanks to everyone behind the camera. You know, I don't know if there's an applause or they can do anything, but I, I applaud them for setting this up. I had some technical issues. So, uh, so a, 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 thanks to those folks as well. Awesome. We appreciate it. Corey. Thank you. Thank you. So we're wrapping up episode three of the Check Complete podcast. Uh, we want to thank our guests who have joined us today. Heather Cribbs uh, hopping on the Zoom call to talk about her refereeing experiences. Really appreciate her just vulnerability as she shared about her story and getting started and, and an experience that many of us can relate to. So we really appreciate, Heather, you jumping on there. And Corey Rockwell, we appreciate, really appreciate his time. Um, Corey is just always a fun one to listen to and engage with. Um, so we really appreciate his time. Uh, as many of you have known, have been watching, we know we always have a word of the week. Last week we did have lurking. This week the word is flabbergast or flabbergasted. Flabbergast is a verb or usually as an adjective is flabbergasted, informal. So verb with object, usually as an adjective, flabbergasted is the informal, uh, would be to surprise greatly, astonish, which is the definition. So to use it in a sentence for those of you who are spelling bee people, this news has me has left me totally flabbergasted. You think you could work that in this next week? I'm going to try my darnest. I don't know if I have the vocabulary for that, but I'm certainly going to try. Yeah. It'll be a tough one, but please try to work that in and let us know how that goes. Uh, it's a lot of fun if you can. Um, so... Make sure you're liking our Facebook page at Check Complete. Um, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Check underscore Complete. Subscribe on YouTube and start liking those videos. And then you can also check out the audio wherever you quench your podcast thirst. We want to hear from you as we had our fan mail section. We want to hear from you. So send in your thoughts, questions, comments via DM, or you can email us questions at checkcompletepodcast.com, or you can email me, Gordy. G-O-R-D-I-E at checkcompletepodcast.com. And, you know, if you have any complaints, we know you probably don't. But if you do, feel free to send them and write them on the bottom of a six-pack of vanishing spray with a holster. And you can send it to our P.O. box. We'll give it right back to you. Probably not. But we'll try to. And don't you dare forget that holster. That's right. Make sure you send us your crew pictures wherever you are working. We've got a few of those that will be rolling as we exit here today. Thanks for watching the Check Complete or listening, whichever one you're doing, the Check Complete podcast. Um, we'll see you soon.